Chapter 23 Review, Part 2. Now in Part 1, I laid down the groundwork in terms of the Hardy-Weinberg theorem, the five conditions of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So if there are five conditions for equilibrium, then the opposite would be true. There are five causes of microevolution, which they're listed right here and they're in your notes. Uh, the first one is genetic drift. Now genetic drift is defined as a change in a population's gene pool due to chance alone. Random change. Now we studied this in lab also. Now what's this got to do with the conditions? Any population can have random change, but the smaller the population, the greater the effects of drift. Okay? So by violating the big population rule, we have a small population, you can get substantial changes just through chance events alone. Now it's like tossing a coin. You know the odds of tossing a coin is 50-50 for heads and tails. If you have a large population of coin tosses, say a million times, you would expect at or very close to a 50-50 ratio. But what if you only toss the coin four times? Would you get 50-50? Maybe, maybe not. So the smaller the population of coin tosses, the greater the likelihood of the deviation of the results. It's just statistical sampling error, and that's what this is about. Now, in nature, assuming that a population was large, there's two ways to get a small population. One is called a bottleneck effect. A bottleneck effect, or genetic bottleneck, is when most of a population is killed off non-selectively and there are a few survivors. And of course, the surviving population may or may not be a genetic representation of the original one. And then you have genetic drift from then on out. Uh, you can read about the examples in the notes. The other one is called a founder effect. The founder effect is when a few individuals leave a population and colonize a new area, being a small population of their own. Okay? And again, I've got some examples of that as well. So that's genetic drift due to a small population size. Next cause of microevolution, gene flow due to migration. So if an individual is migrating, it's taking its genes with it. If an individual comes into a population, it's bringing its genes with them. So if you have two populations, and let's just P equals 0 0.9, Q equals 0 0.1, and let's put Z, P equals 0 0.1, and Q equals 0 0.9. Two different populations. If we have individuals moving across here, you would expect these gene frequencies to change and actually become more like the other. Okay? So if you have migration of the populations, uh, you can have a, a, a merging of the gene pools, but each gene pool is changing. That's microevolution. Third cause, mutation. Uh, we can think of mutation as the origin of a new allele. Now, if we have just two alleles, and their frequencies are P and Q, and there's only two alleles, and their frequencies have to add up to one. But what if we have a new mutation, and we call it A prime? Well, we have to give it its own frequency, R. So now we have three alleles, and you've already changed the gene pool. Now, mutation rates are estimated at one out of every 100,000 to million gametes, which sounds pretty small, except when you consider two things. One, there are many genes in an individual, 20,000 plus. And two, there can be many individuals in a population. So if you do the math, it can actually add up pretty quickly. D, non-random mating. Non-random mating is technically defined as the selection of mates other than by chance. Uh, in your notes, I mentioned several forms of non-random mating. Inbreeding, which is the selection of close relatives. This can happen in a species that doesn't disperse very well, such as garden snails. Uh, if a garden snail is not going to go very far in its lifetime, chances are most of the snails around it are close relatives. Um, I mentioned assortative mating. This is the selection of a mate most like oneself. This is the case with blue geese and snow geese. Or uh, sexual selection. Now your book talks about sexual selection as an example of natural selection, but it's really an example of non-random mating. But with sexual selection, one mate chooses another based on some sort of a courtship feature that attracts the organism most. Now, what that means is that the trait being selected for, out of uh, an array of alternatives, that male or female, depending upon what's doing the choosing, 
is going to have a greater contribution to the future gene pool. It works like natural selection, but it's sexual selection. Uh, again, the one that's the most reproductively fit is the one being chosen the most because of whatever features. Uh, the male peacock with the display is one example. Fiddler crabs, the males have one large claw, that's another example. What sexual selection tends to produce as an outcome is what's known as sexual dimorphism, where the male and the female of a species look clearly different because one's choosing the other based on some courtship or trait. That happens a lot with birds too. Natural selection. Natural selection was discussed in chapter 22, but it is a form, it can cause microevolution. Of all five causes of microevolution, this one's the only one that can cause adaptive change. It can lead to adaptive changes in the gene pool. The others just lead to changes. Okay. Now, in your book, on uh, figure... Twenty-three dot thirteen. Uh, you'll need to be looking at this, these pictures. It shows you modes of selection. Now, um, there's directional selection, disruptive selection, stabilizing selection. Assuming you have, uh, let's use this example here of, of mice, where you have an array of color varieties in mice, but most of them are intermediate color. With directional selection, one end of the spectrum has the advantage. So you would expect over time that the curve will shift in the direction being selected for. With stabilizing selection, the intermediate ones are the ones favored, and you will expect more of them and less of the darker and lighter ones. With disruptive selection, both extremes are favored and the intermediates are disfavored, and you would expect the curve to change to what's called a bimodal curve. Now, if you think about it, if disruptive selection is strong enough to eliminate the middle, that may be a speciation event, which we will discuss in another chapter. But these are modes of selection. So again, refer to the diagram. Now the last part of the notes asks the question, does evolution fashion the perfect organism? Perhaps in a lot of sci-fi movies we talk about the perfect organism and uh, perfect product of evolution. Well, that's not really how it's going to happen because adaptations are often compromises. Uh, so read over your notes on that, uh, and you can also uh, refer to uh, page 484 in the, in the book. And that concludes our review of chapter 23.